If I were your father, which fortunately I am not, and you made any attempt to handle your own business affairs, I would give you a good spanking. In a business way, of course. What would you do if you were my secretary? The same thing. You're hired. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowlane. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 138 today and we are back to Erica's choice. What are we talking about today? Could you tell from our ribald little scene? (laughs) We're doing Trouble in Paradise from 1932, directed by Ernst Lubitsch and starring Miriam Hopkins, Kay Francis, and Herbert Marshall, along with Charlie Ruggles, Edward Everett Horton, and C. Aubrey Smith. It's about two thieves who happen upon each other in Venice, fall madly in love, and then decide to set their sights on a rich widow in Paris for a big haul. It's very loosely based on a Hungarian play from 1931, but more specifically gets its main character from the exploits of a real-life Romanian con man. That was George Manalescu, and his memoir was published in the early 1900s. So this is a pre-code film, and for those of you who may not be familiar with what that means, we're talking about films that were made before the enforcement of the 1935 production code. And that set out strict rules for what could and could not be seen, said, discussed, or shown on screen, all for the sake of saving our mortal souls. Now, pre-1935 wasn't a free-for-all, necessarily, but those pre-code films were way more frank and adult. And then 1935 up through the 60s, Those were big steps back for depicting life as many people experienced it. Would you say that was accurate? Yeah, it was a big drag, actually. Probably more accurately, it was a push and pull. It was a few steps forward, a few steps back. There was a constant pushback against the code. People testing the boundaries, seeing what you could get by with, seeing how you had to dress something up as something else. Until, I guess, Midnight Cowboy came along, basically, and just obliterated all of that. With the big X rating? So yeah, for 30 years or so, the industry was overseen by a bunch of party poopers. This film, though, gets to frolic in a wonderland of adult themes and sexual innuendo, and we get to go along for the ride. It's so very pre-code, in fact, it was described by your favorite David Thompson as truly amoral in the best possible sense. And it was withdrawn from circulation after 1935. Nobody could see it again until 1968. It was never released on VHS, and it only came to DVD in 2003, which is actually how I got to see it. I was lucky enough to see this on the big screen because that period coincided with me being in film school. Oh, one of those early instances maybe of Janice touring a copy of it, probably? I really think so. I don't think we could have gotten to see it otherwise. Do you remember how you first saw it? That DVD release is the first time that I actually got to see it. I really started collecting Criterion titles in 2004, and it was one of the first that I went back and picked up. It was probably one of the first 10 Criterion titles that I bought, period, but I didn't start cataloging them until just a few years ago, so I'm not sure of that purchase date. But I do remember when I only had a handful, it was one of that handful. Well, I can tell you on the big screen, it really does light up the whole theater, so I feel very lucky. Now... What are your favorite pre-code ways of subversively flaunting something they weren't supposed to be showing or talking about? Well, I think actually it's the opposite because part of the beauty of pre-code was that you didn't have to be as subversive as you did under the code. You could be blatant. There was nudity a lot more often. There was an embrace of all kinds of sexuality. Crime could pay back in those days. One of my favorite ways, though, that they were sly about things was just a simple case of hiding things in plain sight. 
you begin to see a shift, less of the costume drama, for instance, and more films set in the current day. And I think that subtly sent a message out to viewers that this is the world we're living in now, and it's a darker, sexier, more dangerous timeline. The popularity of Warner Brothers gangster films, for instance, that certainly indicates that audiences were up for it because those sold tickets like gangbusters. But in the case of Trouble in Paradise, for example, does anything take place in this where the principals aren't reclining somehow, basically? And with this dialogue, let's make sure these pauses are nice and pregnant. You have suggestive fades to the following morning. I always like that. And I enjoy that you had to be smart or at least predisposed to be dirty to catch on to what is going on here. Sounds good. It seems that the insinuation of and the metaphors for sex, they just abound in these films. And yet somehow, all the prudes that made up the Legion of Decency often couldn't see it. And then within these films themselves, the way they police themselves, it's interesting to me that sex versus crime or violence were still two very different and polarizing ideas even then. Hopkins, for example, she pleads with Marshall at one point to not become one of those useless, good-for-nothing gigolos. Stay a crook. Don't be lured into the straight life. Note that she's not equally afraid that he'll be killed or thrown in jail. She's afraid she will lose him via sex. That's the biggest threat. Is she right to be worried about all that? Because forget this puritanical insistence that crime doesn't pay. It pays and gets you sex. Hell yeah. <laughs> well, there are a couple of things that I like here. The shadow of the lovers across the bed. And really any suggestion that they had, quote unquote, done it. Like living together in a state of undress. And then one of our other favorites, Dorothy Arsner's Working Girls. There's that interesting portrayal of sexuality like you talked about. There's some queer coding in there with the other woman who lives in the boarding house. But it's not overtly stated. Yeah, Lubitsch was a sly boots. And I think he's having a little bit of a laugh on us here from the very beginning. None of this is what you think it is. This glittering Venetian canal? As we encounter it, its main function in this case would appear to just be transporting garbage. And an accomplished filmmaker like Lubitsch, he doesn't put anything on the screen accidentally. So it makes me wonder how harsh is this metaphor when the only other thing we see being delivered by Gondola is Miriam Hopkins. It tells me that there's grime behind this glamorous life, this facade, but that it still comes with a song, which I like. Yeah, and she and Herbert Marshall, they are not obviously what they seem at first blush either. Their elegance and their flash, that is merely subterfuge. Scratch them and you uncover nothing but common crooks. Well, exceptional crooks, let's say. But if you find yourself diverted by moonlight on the water and some finely tailored clothes, is Lubitsch suggesting that you may be a sucker? And then even deeper than that, with the most profound love, he suggests that it's an eternal thieving back and forth, basically, which seems super fun, and that is, in fact, preferable. Look at how delightful and joyful the whole thing is, and it keeps you on your toes, too. You can't get complacent. It's such a nimble dance of flirting and love and back and forth. And before we get too far away from this opening sequence, along those lines, we get a glimpse of what looks like a crime scene to start. The very first thing we see is a man waking up on the floor of his hotel room in the dark. And then it pans to Herbert Marshall elsewhere in this hotel. And a great deal of this is miniature. I just want to say this because I love miniatures. I wasn't even thinking that it was miniatures until you mentioned it. We've talked about this before. And I think this is a favorite, though very brief example. This may be top three from the 1930s along with The Lady Vanishes and The Bat Whispers. Doesn't everyone have their own list of their favorite miniature uses in the 1930s? Uh, no, sir. I should start a letterbox list, maybe. Good plan. It'll have three things on it. Well, anyway, as we move between these rooms, oh, it'll have way more than that. Okay. We immediately have this juxtaposition of violence in one room and sex in another. The Baron, he's a capital R romantic, waiting for Miriam Hopkins to be delivered to his room. In a handsome reverie. Yeah, the dinner has to be perfect. Meanwhile, like we say, not everything is on the level here. Miriam Hopkins, she's pulling a grift, and her partner on the phone, this is a great bit of comic relief, she's low rent 
indicative of Miriam Hopkins actual social station. It's really funny and it does two things I really like. It's already the second prominent cut or juxtaposition that emphasizes the visual comedy that's a distinct part of that Lubitsch touch, something I think he might not receive as much credit for, and it really sets the tone for Hopkins' character with one simple scene. I love the back and forth here, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later as well. The camera bouncing back and forth in that scene with Edward Everett Horton and the police going back and forth, him talking about how charming his robber was. Yeah, first of all, it's great to see his face. And then he's been robbed. And he recounts this story for the police and he's working his way through this language barrier. Do you think that the Italian backdrop was to take advantage of the musicality of that spoken language? Because Lubitsch's native German, it certainly wouldn't have been as mellifluous coming out of the switchboard operator or the hotelier relating Horton's story to the police. You think that choice was on purpose? It seems to me indicating his love of music so much as well. It had to have been on purpose. It wouldn't even sound as beautiful as French would be, I would say. Well, at any rate, someone is fleecing the great swells of Europe, it would appear. And I love the metaphor of the hotel life as it applies here. First, the compartmentalization that makes it possible for the elites to maintain their lifestyle with their particular peccadilloes. And then the most suave of the criminal class infiltrating their ritzy environs, and then the possibility of romance and intrigue behind a thousand doors. And back to one of these rooms, the dialogue itself is so witty and sharp, I love a couple of examples. You robbed the gentleman in 253-57-9, and, and then you tickled me when you took the pocketbook from me. So the play between these two soon-to-be lovers and actual thieves is so incredibly charming. Yeah, this scene where Hopkins and Marshall call each other out and identify each other as birds of a feather, it's a real high point for me, especially because her grin is just wonderful. She's so proud of herself because not only has she stolen his watch, but she's regulated it for him. And Lubitsch can't help himself when he has him steal her garter in return. They are definitely birds of a saucy feather. It seems to be true love, but the title implies that that might not always be the case. If everything is wonderful, but you sense that something might be missing, there could be trouble in paradise, as the opening song tells us. So I think it's time we put our own Do Not Disturb sign on the door. <laughs> Let's talk about the famed Lubitsch touch. What does that mean to you? How would you describe what that means to Erica? I think it's got to be style with a European accent. It's a deftness, a lightness of touch, and most of all, a sense of humor, I think. And even in films that are black and white, there just seems to be this gold luster of special moments. We're not taking anything too seriously, especially sex. And I like a few other ways it's been described. Urbane, earthy, and frivolous yet profound. Lubitsch was a man who I think was amused by sex rather than frightened of it. And he made several of our other favorites, Design for Living, To Be or Not To Be, Shop Around the Corner. And unfortunately, he just died way too young in 1947. Miriam Hopkins considered him to be a master craftsman above all things. Well, I agree with everything you've said about it. And then there's one special component of it that sets it apart for me too. The most important part of it I think, is simply a matter of not pandering or compromising. The part of the equation that I love the most is just that. He expects the audience to keep up with those other elements that you mentioned. The wit, the sophistication, the elegance, the effortlessness, the audacious sexual implications and inferences. He doesn't sand the edges of those things off so that the broadest spectrum of the audience will get it. This movie is such an animal unto itself that when I read it described as a romantic comedy, quote unquote, it throws me off a little. That phrase seems so pedestrian when you try to apply it to something as effervescent as this. Now, we're about to meet the third party in our love triangle, and that's the wealthy widow, Madame Collet. She's turning down suitors left and right, especially lantern favorites Charlie Ruggles and Edward Everett Horton. But we're about to get to the crux of the matter here. There's a fateful trip to the opera where her expensive bag will be stolen. 
Now, I'm delighted that this is at least the second film in which we're highlighting some of our absolute favorites, like Herbert Marshall, we talked about him in The Enchanted Cottage, Miriam Hopkins from The Heiress, and our beloved Edward Everett Horton from Top Hat. Plus, we've talked about Charlie Ruggles and C. Aubrey Smith as well. They've appeared in many other films that we've discussed in some other form or fashion. So what is it about them here that attracts you or what attracts you to them in their other work? For example, in the case of Herbert Marshall and Miriam Hopkins, we first talked about them on the show in their somewhat later period. And now we're circling back to their early days. Do you see any difference in their style or personas from this film and their other later work? I do. I feel like all of their personalities here are at their most concentrated. The later films that we've discussed from them, they tend to focus on one aspect of their personas at the expense of the others. Miriam Hopkins is a pip, but you might not know that from the way she is treated in The Heiress. The quality of the material that they're given here, that also helps. They are all being put in the best position to succeed and seem dashing and sexy and funny. For instance, Charlie Ruggles. This is some top flight 1932 comic relief, but especially, I think, because Lubitsch puts a clamp down on the excessive mugging that might take place in some of Ruggles' other performances that makes him a little less appealing to me, at least. I also want to give shout outs to two of my favorite refugees from Marx Brothers films that turn up here, Robert Grieg and Leonid Kinsky. Kinsky especially is always kind of a fun wild card whenever he shows up. People probably know him best as the bartender in Casablanca. But he always brought this offbeat comic sensibility, kind of rangy and weird. You'll recognize his face and voice when you see him, I think. I always liked him best with roles like this in Duck Soup where he was a bit of an anarchist or an agitator. I'm with you on all of that. Miriam Hopkins, I think, was never better. This film puts her smile and her sass to best use. You get all of her sexy spark without the punishment she gets in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Or like you mentioned in The Heiress, when I think part of her was sublimated or sort of tamped down. Herbert Marshall is great in anything, but as a hunk here, he cannot be surpassed. He doesn't have to be saddled with being someone's uncle like in The Enchanted Cottage, just someone's daddy, if you know what I mean. And I think that you do. <laughs> Kay Francis, who cares? But she doesn't <laughs> detract from anything. That's not fair. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit. But. We will. Edward Everett Horton here gets some great sarcasm, which we don't always get to see. And C. Aubrey Smith was always 100 years old, I think. Speaking of hunks, did you know that Cary Grant was considered for the role of Gaston? Do you see that working at all? I can't. He would have been way too young at the time. I think Lubitsch used Herbert Marshall's age and even Kay Francis's age to good effect. It was on purpose. Samuel Raffleson talked about learning from Lubitsch that there needs to be a bedrock of experience and awareness. So I think that's why Herbert Marshall works so well here. I think you nailed it. I think Cary Grant only would have had about half of what he needed at that point to do this. He was still in his 20s where Herbert Marshall was in his early 40s here. And to do this correctly, you're exactly right. This sort of thing requires a sense of worldliness and experience. That is definitely where Marshall is superior. And again, being put in the best possible position to turn in an excellent performance. I bet Herbert Marshall smelled really good. What do you bet? I hope so. I don't like to think about him smelling like cigarettes or anything well, like that. Yeah, maybe. It's his experience, though. That allowed him to be as good a thief as he was. You have to be somewhat of a renaissance man to insinuate yourself among these swells. Art, business, multiple language, knowledge of furniture and cosmetics. This is not the kind of acumen that you pick up by 22. Now, back to the lovers. They've been together at least a year and everything is still really sexy, but they're low on cash. So they hatch a scheme to return that fabulously expensive bag of Madame Collet's that they stole at the opera in order to get the substantial reward. Gaston proves to be so incredibly dashing and irresistible when returning the bag and accepting the reward. Make it out to cash. I love so that. So true. <laughs> Even while he's schooling Mariette on how she should be receiving love letters, 
what lipstick and powder she should use, and so on, that he is hired on the spot as her secretary. Yeah, this scene is great. This whirlwind that surrounds him going to the house. It's so full of wonderful moments and especially clever observations about class and sex, I think, and how they're intertwined here. We have a whole spectrum of participants from this anarchist that's come to chastise her about the cost of this missing handbag and the excesses of her spending to the madame herself who craves the discipline of the aforementioned spanking at the hands of Gaston, who in turn occupies a spot between the two exemplifying the sophistication of the upper crust, but only to exploit them. The speed, grace, and ease with which he insinuates himself into the household is remarkable. And then he installs Hopkins in the house almost as quickly, Shades of Parasite. If you haven't seen that, check that out. She's the secretary to the secretary, so she can free up Gaston's time so he can direct it at Madame Collet. I have to say, this whole montage where... Gaston is still schooling Mariette, is wonderful specifically when she goes into that plow pose like this, Monsieur Laval. That blew me away when I first saw it. Is this term plow pose, is this a yoga thing or is this a Kama Sutra thing? This or is both? a yoga thing. I don't know where the yoga part came from, though. Well, this montage and the way he uses multiple techniques, I think this is one of the perfect examples of these movies that I love that fall in the early days of sound. This actually comes a little later in that cycle, but it still has some of that quality. They have a specific space in them waiting to be filled up. And in the good ones, it's not dead air exactly. It's kind of a sonically experimental quality that I really find charming. And we talked about music a little bit already. Did Lubitsch love music or did he love music? It's one of those things that I really relate to about him. He was truly revolutionary when it came to the way music was used in film. It was head and shoulders above his peers. And his first talkie was basically the first Hollywood film to blend song and narrative. And then the quality of even the little details sets it apart. We weren't even out of the opening titles and he's already hitting us with a clever internal rhyme scheme in the title song. Even the trash barge is helmed by a booming tenor. So music is everywhere and so perfectly used. This era of early sound, for me, that's 1929 to 1932 is kind of how I think of it, where talented filmmakers knew how to take advantage of. It's one of my favorite periods. And when you go through the Marx Brothers early output, for example, you can see the entire evolution. It goes from clumsily, statically recording a stage play, essentially, to these anarchic breakneck romps with a dozen moving pieces in every scene. And I think the thing that benefited so many of my favorites in the early sound days, you've got the Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields, is also what benefited Ernst Lubitsch. So much of a joke is how it sounds, not just what it says. And I should be even more specific. It's not just jokes. It's specifically wit that I'm thinking about. Good wit always has a specific voice. It's a crucial component. And here's an experiment that I think demonstrates exactly what I mean. You've likely never heard Oscar Wilde's recorded voice, right? Gosh, I'm trying to think now. I don't think I have. And yet, when you read his work, even in just snippets, or maybe especially that way, I practically guarantee that you hear what you imagine to be his voice in your head. Absolutely. It totally comes from the importance of being earnest. Mm. That's the voice I have in my head. I hear Stephen Fry. But it wouldn't be as effective as just the written word, just text on a title card. And that's what makes this film such a joy, too. These sly innuendos that Marshall just leaves hanging in the air. And then on the opposite side, the way that Miriam Hopkins, she more brashly leans into them just a little bit more without sound and Lubitsch knowing how to take best advantage of it, so much of this would be lost. It's still amazing to me to think that this was his first non-musical sound comedy and he took off running. I like especially those moments when he knew to have no sound dialogue, which is so interesting to me, like at the opera. It conveys action and mood and tempo or showing us those clocks and letting us hear voices to convey a different action and mood. While I'm thinking about it, one thing that I wondered the first time I was watching this, I recall thinking, is Colet a real company? Is this product placement or is this a sly nod to an actual person? Coco Chanel maybe was the first person that came to mind. But after doing some reading in retrospect, I think it's an even more subtle and sexy nod that Lubitsch is making here. I can't wait. Tell me all about it. 
Lubitsch is clearly fond of Paris, right? We see it over and over again. And I think this may be a reference to Gustave Flaubert and his lover, Louise Collet. I'd completely forgotten about her, whom I have studied until you just said that. Yeah, they carried on a torrid eight-year love affair, and his letters to her frequently reference scent or perfume, particularly her preference for verbena. It may be a reach, I don't know, but it seems like the kind of romantic detail that someone as literate and witty as Lubitsch might file away for later use. I like to think that she's the inspiration for that name. Well, speaking of Madame Collet and the actress who portrays her, Kay Francis, we're at a pretty pivotal moment here. Asking him out to dinner, flirting, saying goodnight. I always, though, I have to confess, thought of Kay Francis as a pretty dull performer, especially compared to Miriam Hopkins. But in her personal life, which I started reading a little bit more about, she sounds like she was pretty rambunctious. Her final wishes were also really interesting, especially to you. She said she essentially wanted to leave no record of her existence behind, <laughs> as if she'd never been. No legacy, nothing. You're right. I love that. Apparently, on some sets, she had to have a minder, so she didn't get into any funny business. Which I assume was sex, as opposed to drugs or something else like that. Which makes me like her a whole lot more. But really... This is my only experience with her. So does she strike you the same way? Not exactly, because I think her temperament really suits this character. Because I think of this character as having all the sex she wants all the time. This is the first instance where she's probably ever encountered anyone who has denied her in any way. But she's always gone about it in this languid, carefree way because she hasn't needed to put that much effort into it either because of her money or whatever other reason. So I think she works for this part exactly. In terms of choosing between the two, I know which one I would pick, but I think she works for this. And she was certainly boffo at the box office, as they say. For the first half of the 30s, she was Warner Brothers' highest paid and most successful actress. She was on loan to Paramount to make this. And I think her roles actually became more interesting after this period in her career. But as far as attraction or appeal, it's a matter of preference, I know. Kay Francis isn't in the same league for me and what I like as Miriam Hopkins. If I am Gaston, there is no decision to be made here. Mariette now throws a big garden party and everyone is there, including her suitors. Everyone who's anyone. Definitely. And importantly, we're wondering, is Edward Everett Horton going to recognize Gaston as his robber? There's a fun thing happening here. Charlie Ruggles and Edward Everett Horton, who've been rivals so far and clearly hate each other, tell each other that they hate each other, they're starting to become kind of pals. Hashtag frenemies. I think so. There's something happening with their placement too, and so I started to wonder, do you feel like there's any queer coding happening here with their evolving relationship? Because... They don't seem to really want to marry Mariette or maybe any woman. And they're constantly seated closer and closer together. By the way, I've got one fun fact for you. They were born in the same year, 1886. Second, smaller fun fact, C. Aubrey Smith was born in 1863. I love C. Aubrey Smith. He looks literally like a turn-of-the-century political cartoon come to life. It's unbelievable. Tibby Canoe and Tyler, too. Something. Yeah. <laughs> But as far as the rest of it, are you kidding me? Of course that's happening. This discussion they have where Charlie Ruggles is regaling Horton with tales of harems, all kinds, he specifically stresses. Ooh, la la. Yeah, it's there. It often was with Horton. There are a number of character actors from that time period whose presence was intended to indicate a certain flexibility with sexuality, shall we say. Franklin Pangborn is another favorite of mine from that time. But Lubitsch worked so often with Edward Everett Horton that there was probably a degree of comfort and trust between the two that I think may have contributed to a more clever and honest treatment of those themes. Because there's no judgment in it. It all sounds like a great time. Yeah, exactly. Even though the movie was almost lost, you already talked about this, its embrace of those ideas and others like them, it's pulled out of circulation, doesn't show up on the cultural radar again for 30 plus years, never had that VHS release like you said. 
when it finally came back on DVD, we had essentially been missing it for 70 years, all because Edward Everett Horton and Charlie Ruggles might be moving from figurative to literal dick measuring contests, and Madame Collet likes to be spanked occasionally. Back to Marriott and Gaston, they're definitely getting closer, and she's encouraging him, and there's that wonderful ping pong of which door are they going to come out of. And I want to bring up this camera style here right now. I love this panning and almost tennis match style in some scenes. It really seems to me to be Lubitsch thumbing his nose at other filmmakers who were still figuring out what to do with the camera in the early 30s. Because those same kinds of techniques in other films would be employed to a really dull effect. Panning instead of editing or choosing a more interesting camera placement or blocking. What do you think? First of all, sex makes all of that more interesting automatically. But I mentioned earlier that I think his visual humor is underrated, and that happens all sorts of ways. I think you're on the money here about there being an element of parody of some of the techniques that we see. But then sometimes it's a case of the method suits the style, because you have Gaston. He is an expert deflector, and he's often redirecting Inquisition back at people. And then even little visual jokes are tucked in there. For example, Hopkins' glasses, when she comes into the room the first time, always makes me laugh. But it's a joke that's operating on multiple levels. There's the immediate visual impact, and then you have to consider which is funnier. The fact that these sophisticates think that this old gag will actually work to make her come across as more innocent and less of a threat, or that it actually works. I should amend that, actually, now that I think about it. Because in the meantime... Horton is getting close to putting this together that Marshall was his assailant. Not everybody falls for it, so Hopkins and Marshall have to clear out. And one thing I really appreciate here in terms of equitable treatment, Hopkins is every bit the crook that Marshall is. She can match him step for step in terms of these labyrinthine preparations or knowing when to hit the parachute when it's time to hop that train out of town. She's packed. She's ready to go. But there's going to be some change in plan that Gaston is initiating before they make this final big theft. Now, the first time I watched this, I do admit, I did wonder for a minute if he would turn and what his game was. Did you have any doubts as to who he would go with at any point? In terms of either staying with Mariette or hitting the road again with Lily, I really don't think it's clear that he ever loved Marriott, which is an assessment that some people have made. So to me, there was never a doubt that he was going to take off with Lily, and I was just waiting for how he would make it happen. Well, I think I've made it clear that he would be nuts not to go with Miriam Hopkins, but then Lubitsch confirms that for me. He takes a shot of him in the mirror as this is happening, and that clarifies everything for me. Marshall is being duplicitous, and I don't have to worry. But... Is he trying to have his cake and eat it too by postponing their departure to the next morning? If I can squeeze an extra night out of this, wink, wink, why wouldn't he? Because looking at it objectively, it would just be an evenly applied amorality. Their feelings about love and sex, specifically Hopkins' character, they sometimes surprise me. I think of these characters as being more freewheeling and not as encumbered by traditional morality, kind of a Weimar-era vibe. The Major, it turns out, is more of a libertine than they are with his whole bit about taking his fun where he finds it. Madame Calais at one point very specifically says, but I don't want to be a lady. So which is worse? Is it the scandal of the whole thing or is it actually the threat of losing a lover? It may be, I think, that the conflicted tone around love and sex had to do with Lubitsch dealing with the infidelity of his wife and the end of their marriage just the year before. Interesting. You made me think of something just now, and it strikes me in the way that you phrased your last few sentences that gender and class, I think, play the biggest part here. There are different rules for both, both genders, both classes, being upper or much lower, and that that's really what has to be gotten over, or that's what we're reflecting on. Joe Bob Briggs said something the okay. other day. That I think is appropriate here, though it may be a little too post-World War II, but basically that idea is, Americans, we can take all the violence and gore in the world, but sex is right out. 
I think we see that going all the way back to our puritanical roots. If you want to trace American history and their interaction with those two things, sex and violence, it is unfortunately very clear which one we are more comfortable with. But we're doing our part to swing that pendulum. Yeah. We're probably leaving out one thing, too, now that I think about it. Sex, violence. Miriam Hopkins, she opts for a third choice here, and she's taking that cash. And this is all part of this house of cards that's now collapsing all around them. Jerome is doing Gaston a favor by threatening to expose him in this moment, but he doesn't know it. Jerome is a crook, too. Horton finally puts it all together. Venice is where he knows him from. Gaston reveals himself to Madame Collet as Monescu. It's so fun to watch while all of this is just crumbling before them, their whole subterfuge, he is still deftly stepping between raindrops almost. The way he thinks on his feet is incredible. He's responding to everything that Madame Collet is trying to use to force him into a corner. It's masterful. He's employing partial truths here and there. Then Hopkins stomps in and she reveals herself too and she trumps all of that with her bluntness overriding all of his deft evasions. She's not going to accept Madame Collet's dirty money. She's going to take it. And she leaves, storms out, and Gaston and Mariette have their final love scene. It could have been marvelous, glorious. And he still takes that necklace (laughs) as a gift to Lily. It could have been glorious, but there's also that beautiful melancholy undercurrent that they are also recognizing it would never last. He makes the right decision, obviously, like I think, in terms of choosing the right partner that will best sustain him and also avoid incarceration. Involving the police is just so gauche. Do you despair when you're watching this on behalf of Madame Collet, or is this just the cost of doing romantic business among the rich and fabulous? I do not despair of the rich, ever. They've got many, many more resources. So she can just cry herself to sleep on her pillow full of money. Exactly. What is it about a cat burglar or a high-class thief that so intrigues audiences? By the way, this real person that at least in part the story was based on, the Romanian con man, he was the basis for two other silent films. Everybody loves to see this. Everybody wants to be this person. The escapist side of the equation of films made during the Great Depression, that's a powerful element. Wouldn't it be great if we were all idle and rich and sexy and having dashing, bold adventures all the time? And I think it's crucial, like we were saying about the pre-code thing in this example, that they get away with it and they are clearly having a good time doing it and are going to go back to some fancy hotel and roll around in the bed a lot afterwards. That sounds like a good time anytime, depression era or not. I think more and more for me, too, it's about sticking it to the rich. I enjoy it. I do want to make a distinction, though. I don't want to make it sound like this wish fulfillment was all that people went to the movies for during that time. There were plenty of films that were more realistic about the troubles that people were having. But when it came to serving up something elegant and diverting in the early 30s, no one could touch Ernst Lubitsch. But while you've got me thinking about this ending and what is so appealing about the elite thief, with as much true crime as I consume, I have to say I am often completely baffled by some of the more extreme crimes committed by couples. The part I think I find most fascinating is who floated this idea first? And in the case of elaborately planned murder, for instance, especially when it's killing one lover to be with another, my biggest question is always, if they'll do this to this person, what makes you think they won't do it to you when they get tired of you eventually? But who brings that up? What do you think if we kill this guy? It's not something that you're going to be talking about over the average dinner table. These two, though, they're a match made in heaven, it feels like. Like attracts like. And the idea of them operating as a team instead of two solo acts, it's super exciting, being as we can sign off on them fleecing socialites. I'm sure the Depression-era audiences could certainly get behind that. Their targets can almost justify being a sort of twisted Robin Hood. We steal from the rich and give to ourselves and have a great time doing it. This compartmentalization that we talked about earlier, the way it applies here in terms of having this amorality that allows you to be a career criminal, but then you do not also use that to betray a partner, it's fascinating to me. How do you classify this? Is this romance? Is this more operating by a code, honor among thieves and all that? I think about something that you've said before in terms of that psychological aspect that they can spot who they need. 
I wonder if these sort of people feel like they found their soulmates and therefore that is the only person who will understand them and vice versa. That's a great point. Sometimes you just know. And if you get really lucky, they like to commit all the same crimes that you do. Getting back to our auteur here, I have a question about Lubitsch for you. Of all the great directors of the golden age, is there anyone that you would rather hang out with than this guy? Probably not, but maybe George Cukor. I think he would be kind hmm. of fun as a person. Jean Renoir, I think, hmm. would be pretty interesting to hang out with. And then I guess Ida Lupino, even though she wasn't directing during this period, she was starting to act. Yeah, but Lubitsch, he loved music. He clearly loved a good dirty joke. He had the vision of an auteur before we even knew what that was. And he liked to provoke, I think. Just look at To Be or Not To Be, which is my favorite of all his films. The balance of darkness and light in that thing is handled with such pinpoint accuracy that it is exquisite. I did read that he was really into cigars, so that would make it a little difficult for me. It may be that I just find all of these characteristics charming individually, but it seems like he would have been a blast to work with. Herbert Marshall is the one mm. that I want to hang out with. So how about your recommendation? I'm going to keep hanging out with Lubitsch for this. I am going with The Smiling Lieutenant from the year before, from 1931. And that's directed by Lubitsch again and starring Maurice Chevalier, Claudette Colbert, and once again teams up with Miriam Hopkins and Charlie Ruggles. It's about a wink gone astray, and as a result, a soldier has no choice but to marry the visiting princess who mistakenly intercepted that gesture. Now, we were lucky enough to see this on the big screen at Austin Film Society a couple of years ago, and it was one of the most fun times I've had at the movies. How about you? Talk about lighting up the theater with its frothiness. Once again, it's the classic Lubitsch love triangle, except even more ribald and musical than some of the other examples. Chevalier spends half the time looking straight into the camera and wiggling his eyebrows suggestively. I can't remember if he explicitly ever says ooh la la, but he might as well have. I think more like oh ho ho ho. <laughs> Miriam Hopkins and Claudette Colbert, they come together as sort of a fun double act in the latter half of the film to marvelous effect. It's exactly as racy and funny and delightful as you would expect. I want to ask you a question while I'm thinking about it here. Do you have a preference when it comes to Lubitsch's triangles, because it just occurs to me that what I consider his two best films, To Be or Not To Be and Design for Living, specifically have two men competing for the attention of one woman, whereas the examples we talked about today, Trouble in Paradise and Smiling Lieutenant, they are the opposite. They have two women competing for one man. Does one arrangement lend itself better to what Lubitsch does, or is the appeal and success of the story just a matter of the particular cast and material? You have to know what I'm going to answer. Okay. Two men, one <laughs> woman. For sure, Design for a Living being my favorite. Well, I think we're both right. What about you? What's your recommendation? The recommendation I went with was also inspired by the same source material as Lubitsch's The Shop Around the Corner, and that is the musical She Loves Me. I've now watched this three times, and that's the revival from 2016 through PBS's Great Performances Broadway at Home series. I've watched it with you here and there, just sitting in for pieces of it. This thing is worth watching just for the set design, for the Art Nouveau beauty of the thing. Absolutely. You can attest to how gorgeous and ingenious that set is, and it was designed by David Rockwell, by the way. So this revival was directed for the stage by Scott Ellis, and it's from the book by Joe Mastroff, with lyrics by Sheldon Harnick and music by Jerry Bach. It stars Laura Benanti, Zachary Levi, Byron Jennings, Gavin Creel, Tom McGowan, and Jane Krakowski. The story is probably familiar to a lot of us. Two feuding store clerks are, unbeknownst to them, the dearest of pen pals. And this just seems to flow so naturally on the stage as a musical. I personally love to be able to see theater on my own screen, and I highly recommend all of Great Performances Seasons. The music itself is really fun and well put together. It's a lot different from other shows that you may be familiar with. It's not singable in the same way that we think of something like Cabaret, for example. And I think that's because of the way it's constructed. It progresses 
and intrigues and trips off the tongue, though, nonetheless. So watch it and tell me what you think. So once again, that's two great recommendations, The Smiling Lieutenant and She Loves Me. And that brings us to the end of episode 138. First and foremost here, I would like to say a special thank you to David Sutar for becoming our newest Patreon supporter. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Leanne Kubich, Spencer Seams at the We Cut Heads podcast, Brian Sauer, Carly Weems, Laura Cannon at the Fatal Films podcast, Andy Wolverton, Drew Tavendale and the Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film, Mick Erdley, Jane Sankner, Derek Power, Nick Licata, Jake Lindbergh, Justin Henry, and Chris Polizza. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. Thank you to the nice anonymous person that recently left us a five-star rating on iTunes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 